that associated faith than they did about faith and relationship with God. And so Jesus was constantly saying, watch out for those guys because they'll come and rob you of the life that God has intended for you. Are you with me so far? Amen. Beware of the leaven. Now the Pharisees were those members of a party. They were the descendants of the Maccabees. Now the Maccabees were great. As a matter of fact, in the Catholic Bible, there's a couple books called First and Second Maccabees. But the Maccabees were the revivalists of the day after the 400 silent years, which ended around the time that Jesus came back. 400 years where God did not speak by revelation or by prophet or by anybody. I don't know about you, but I think he was upset. You know, somebody didn't talk to you on purpose. They're probably upset with you, right? In case you, in case you didn't notice that. 400 silent years, the Maccabees rose up and said, let's get back to the word. Let's get back to faith. Let's get back to God. Let's get back to a hunger for God. And so they were the revivalists of their day. And the Pharisees came out of that revival of the Maccabees. So they had a very powerful and very interesting history. So that's who the Pharisees derived from. They believed in the resurrection and in following the legal traditions that were ascribed not to the Bible, but to, to the traditions of the fathers. Matter of fact, Jesus said one time, he said, you're more interested in the, the traditions than you are in the, the Father. And he rebuked them for it. That's one thing about Jesus. He was not afraid, about relig not afraid of religious people. Like the scribes, they were also well-known legal experts. The, but Jesus said they were full of greed, self-indulgence, and self-righteousness. That's in Luke chapter 18, verses 10 to 14 in the New Living Bible. What happened there was, you remember the guy, the Pharisee walks into the temple and uh, another guy walks in. He's a tax collector. He's you know, considered to be the low of the low. And the Pharisee walks in and he says, God, thank you that I'm not like him. Well, my, one of the things that we make a mistake of doing is comparing our faith to other people's faith. The Bible says that they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. And it's ungodly to come in there and to determine your level of faith and status with God based off of the status of someone else who you perceive to be sinning. It's ungodly. It's really unhealthy. And too often we d define ourselves by that very measure. And that's a pharisaical spirit. That's a religious spirit. When we talk about religion, religion that exalts traditions above the word of God is dangerous and lethal for you as a believer. It's important that you believe. It's important that you walk in love. It's important that you humble yourself. It's important that you learn to love others who are different than you. Who struggle with issues. Instead of looking down on them and saying, thank God I'm not like him. That's ungodly. And that is a religious spirit. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. We're going to talk about leaven once again. Leaven is defined and symbolizes something negative. It's the symbol of sin in the New Testament. Just as yeast permeates the ingredients, we know the Bible says that knowledge puffs up. The Bible says the knowledge puffs up. It works like leaven. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I've met certain people, and they read a book, and all of a sudden, they become puffed up. Because knowledge puffs up. And then, so I get nervous about sometimes when people read certain books, because it's like now they know everything about that subject. When that was just one author and their opinion and how they shared it. You've got to be careful. We have to be careful. I have to be careful when I read stuff that it does not puff me up. It was a good time to say amen. amen. Matthew chapter 3 verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism... He said unto them, O generation of vipers. i got to tell you a viper story. 
we went and put a bunch of new toilets in the uh, church, the old church. There was about 13 bathrooms there, so we had to change all the toilets out. And you can imagine it was no small expense. But the guy came to me and he said, well, what kind of toilets do you want? I said, well, I didn't know there was different kinds of toilets. He said, yeah, we've got Viper toilets and we've got Gerber toilets. And I said, well, if I put the Gerber toilets in, people will say, see, look, at it. it's a church full of baby food. <laughs> and if I put the Viper toilets in, somebody will come and say, well, it's a brood of Vipers. I said, I, I don't know. You pick one. <laughs> uh, that, that was, it was funny at the time. <laughs> you brood of Vipers, he said. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? They are aware of times and seasons. Uh, uh, religious people are aware of times and seasons, but they will not enter into truth. If you look at verses 8 to 10 there, it talks about being repentant and not trusting in your heritage. That's one of the things that the Pharisees did. Well, we're, we're of Abraham. We're this. We're that. My goodness. It's about relationship with Christ Jesus. It's about knowing him. It's about loving him. It's about serving one another. It's having the attitude and the heart of a servant. Someone say amen. amen. Religious people are unrepentant and self-righteous. They trust in their heritage and the good deeds of their past. Romans chapter 9 verses 30 to 32. Chapter 10 verse 3 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness... And seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Paul said this in Philippians 3 verse 9. And being found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law. But that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is by faith in Christ. Remember in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve sinned. God comes down and says what, what, who did this mess? And the Bible says that Adam and Eve had sewn together fig leaves, designer fig leaves, made by broken human nature. Self-righteousness was evident back then. What? I'm going to hide my sin myself. I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to cover it up. Self-righteousness exists in Jesus' day, and it still exists. It's something that you have to guard against. That's why relationships with people, with elders, with leaders, with, with pastors, with the, uh, ministers. That's why it helps us to, to be able to look at our own life and to see if we are walking in self-righteousness. It's one of the most dangerous things. It's one of the symbols of religiosity. Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. Another characteristic of a Pharisee. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. These guys like fasted all the time. They did all kinds of religious things. They were very, very disciplined. They did it to be seen by men. Therefore, there's their reward and they have no reward from God. Religious people trust in themselves and not in the righteousness that comes from God himself. They have a fig leaf self-protection mentality. Yeah. Matthew chapter 9 verse 11. All over the book of Matthew this morning. Matthew chapter 9 verse 11. Notice the 9-1-1. And when Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Verse 12, Jesus' tongue-in-cheek statement says to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus desired mercy and not sacrifice. Amen. Religious people don't see themselves as sick or as sinners and are addicted to self-sacrifice and self-righteousness. Matthew 9, verse 14 Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we 
and the uh, Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast. Religious people are sometimes very disciplined and quick to notice when others aren't as strong or perceived to not be as strong as they are. They tend to be disdainful of others' weaknesses. That's a sign of religiosity. Matthew 9, 34. But the Pharisees said, you'll notice this, like just every few verses, Jesus is addressing the Pharisees and the leaven of the Pharisees. That leaven that is able to go in and permeate and puff up and make something what it was never supposed to be. You'll notice most of the offerings in the Old Testament, if not all of them, it was unleavened bread because that was a symbol of Christ and his life. No sin. It represents no sin. Why did the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples fast not? Religious people are sometimes very disciplined, quick to notice when others aren't as strong as they are, and they tend to be disdainful of others' weaknesses. Matthew 9.34, But the Pharisees said, He casts out devils through the prince of devils. Religious people are quick to see in others their own problems, and they are threatened by other people's strengths that capture people's attention. They are easily made jealous. They're not strong. They appear strong, but they're not strong. Matthew 12, verse 2. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, your disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Religious people believe man was made for the Sabbath. But Jesus clearly said the Sabbath was made for man. Isn't it funny how it's backwards? Mark. That's in Mark chapter 2, verse 27. In Matthew 23, verse 16, in regards to this thought, he called them, the Pharisees, the blind guides. He asked, and he says this, does the goal sanctify the temple, or does the temple sanctify the goal? It's not a trick question. We know that the temple sanctifies the gold. So what you do doesn't sanctify you. It's because you're sanctified in Christ that what you do is acceptable before God. Very important. Because you, you don't get to heaven and you don't earn brownie points with God by doing good things. It's good to do good things. It's important to do good. But that's not what's going to save you. Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. Jesus heals the crippled man on the Sabbath day. Religious people are threatened by people who believe and rest in God. They seek others like themselves who are jealous, then secretly and overtly attempt to destroy others' reputations in order to maintain a false sense of control. The one thing that put Jesus on the cross was religion. Religion killed Christ. Sin killed Christ. Jesus knew that all along. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Religious people are quick to discredit what they don't understand and then quick to offer their opinion. One of the signs of religiosity. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would seek a sign from you. Religious people are slow to believe and seek a sign from God to prove to them his existence or his power. Jesus then said in verse 39 and verse 40, an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign and that no sign would be given unto them except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What was the sign of the prophet Jonah? Very simple. 
Just as Noah was in the heart of the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man would be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And that was the sign that Christ came to fulfill. So then religious people tempt God by demanding a sign, which Jesus called evil. And their heart is in love with themselves, and they want to be friends with the world. James chapter 4, verse 4, You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity against God. Religion is the biggest enemy of God. The leaven of the Pharisees. Adding tradition, adding what you think. you got to be really careful too when you correct others. The Bible says to do it in the spirit of meekness and gentleness. Sometimes we're more concerned about being right than we are about walking in love. And we crush people in the process, yet we feel so righteous. I feel so good about myself. I, I would never do that. Really. Have you been under the same temptation? Have you been under the same situation and faced that? I'm even careful when people in, that are not even Christians end up falling into temptation and doing dumb things. I'm like, oh God, that's terrible. Have mercy. It's so easy to be critical of others. Matthew 15, verse 1. Then came Jesus, speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Religious people are always worried. Jesus didn't say this, but this was the thought. Religious people were always worried about other people's sins. Maybe we should take the log out of our own eye first before we try to take a speck out of our brother's eye. They're also very aware that they were from Jerusalem. I'm from Jerusalem. They have a lot of confidence and experience, heritage, schooling, or association with other bigwigs. You know what uh, I read the other day? You know what the definition is of a big shot? It's a little shot that kept shooting. <laughs> so these guys were hanging out with the big shots. Their association will come up often in their conversation in being so worried about who transgressed the elders' traditions. Jesus accused them in verse 3 of transgressing the word of God through their traditions. And that's what you have to be more careful of. Matthew chapter 15, verse 12. Then came his disciples and said unto them, Knowest Thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Religious people will take offense easily. Verse chapter 8 and verse 9 in that same chapter sets the context for what Jesus is saying here. That their mouth is well versed, but their heart is far from God. Don't be overly impressed with people who can know the scriptures necessarily. Don't be overly impressed by that. Some people say, oh, I, I, I don't remember where it's written, but I, you know, I know what the Bible says. That's okay. You don't have to know the chapter in the verse. As a matter of fact, if you're rebu rebuking demons, you don't have to know where it's written. All these numbers were added centuries ago, not thousands of years ago when they were first said. So when you say Matthew 15, verse 1, verse 4, verse 6, I mean, it's good to know, especially if you're a, a teacher or a pastor and, you, and you're teaching the Word of God, it's important to know where it is so that people can reference it. But when you speak to the devil, you speak, in fact, about your relationship with God and tell that devil to move. Tell that devil to get out of your life. Tell that devil to quit harassing you, your family, you just got to know what the Word says. And based off of your relationship with God, take that authority yes. and begin to speak the Word of God over your life. Religious people take offense easily. Their doctrines are that which pleases men and not God. 
as long as they're trying to please men, they'll always remain easily offended. Matthew 16, verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempted Jesus, desired him that he should show them a sign from heaven. Religious people seek signs and wonders to follow them because they need to be confirmed by these. But the Bible tells me that faith-filled people, it says these signs shall follow those who believe. Don't look to signs and wonders to guide your faith. Look to your relationship with Christ and let signs and wonders follow you in your life. Again, religion is backwards. Matthew 16 and verse 6, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Religious people take extreme positions like being diametrically, uh, you know, the, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees hated each other until Jesus showed up. Then they found something they hated more and all of a sudden they were working together even though they were, they were diametrically opposed in their faith. Isn't that funny? It's too bad that we're defined by what we hate rather than what we love. I had a guy come into the church. And he came up to me and he said, that's wrong. Jesus should not be on the cross. I said, oh really? I said, then why did Paul say we preach Christ and him crucified? My very first sermon when we bought this building, because when I walked in, I walked in through the music room door, I came in through here, and I saw that. I, I love artwork. To me, it's a, it's a wonderful symbol of art to me. And uh, I remember... The Lord said to me, I, I felt in my heart that God impressed me. You just leave that right there. And I was like, yeah, but I'm a Protestant. And Protestants like crosses with, you know, no Jesus on it because he's resurrected. And the Lord began to impress on me. My first sermon, all I talked about was the fact that the Bible says so many times to remember his death till he comes. We take communion to remember his death Till he comes. Paul preached Christ and him crucified. Oh yes, preach the resurrection. But you can't have a resurrection without a death. So that's why we left that there. Not so that we could focus just on that and, and, and you know, be morbid or anything like that. But to remember that's where it all started. And if you look around the church, outside, inside and everywhere... There are crosses with no Jesus on it because he was raised from the dead for you. Amen. What a great God. Matthew 16, verse 11. How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? The context of this verse is somewhat revealed by verse 7 of that same chapter. They reasoned among themselves. They reasoned among themselves. Verse 8, Jesus said, Oh, you of little faith, you still don't understand. It's funny how reasoning sometimes can lead to little faith. Now, should we be reasonable people? Absolutely. But there are things that you understand by faith and not just by reason alone. Religious people trust in their reasoning way too much. And at times, therefore, or thereby, have little faith and limited understanding of the Father's love and His consistent character. Matthew 16 and verse 12, the next verse. Then they understood how He had bade them not to, not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. More emphasis on religion. Colossians chapter 2 verses 8 and verse 18. You can uh, look these up. But it's twice Jesus says, or Paul says, let no man cheat you, rob you of your faith through the vain traditions that you receive from your forefathers. Be very careful. Matthew 19 verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him, tempting him and saying unto him, 
Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Righteous people will use scriptures to support their ideas and desires. It's not righteous people, sorry. Religious people use scriptures to support their ideas and desires. They are factitious. Titus chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. It says, beware of a factitious man, someone who likes to separate and divide and cause trouble. Beware of those folks. They're divisive, and they use scriptures to bring strife in people's lives. Scriptures become their idol and not the Lord and the living relationship with him. Now, you know how much I love the Word. I love the Scriptures. I love understanding the Word. I love the way it pieces together. I love the way revelation and understanding comes. But listen, as carefully as I know how to say this, this book is not my God. Jesus Christ is my Lord. And through this book, He speaks to me. So my relationship with Christ is more important to me than just trying to be learn the letter of the law. Amen to that. Matthew 21, verses 45 and 46. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took Jesus as a prophet. Religious people are aware that they lack deep relationship with the Lord. And they know, what the, they know the scriptures and the spirit are speaking to them, calling them to deeper levels of relationship that they're too wrapped up in themselves and the crowds. get that far with God. Matthew 22, verse 15. There's so many verses. My goodness. I've got another page and a half of, of different verses where Jesus, uh, uh, Matthew 22, verse 15, Matthew 22, verses 23 to 33, and you can look all of these up. Matthew 22, verse 34, Matthew 22, verse 41, Matthew 23, verse 2. Time and time again, every few verses, Jesus is addressing the Pharisee and the religious spirit and the leaven that can come in and eat and destroy your faith. Be careful, he says. Be careful, he says. Then the, the Pharisees took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Religious people are always trying to catch people in their words. Love covers a multitude of sins. Religion exposes people's weaknesses in faith and faults. Matthew 22, verses 33 to 33, uh, 23 to 33. The Sadducees who say there is no resurrection. Religious people will even deny miracles and then explain them away. Like the, the one where uh, Jesus was born of a virgin. There's a theory called the Parthenogenesis theory. And in that, this is a scientific fact, They'll take lower plant life forms and they'll give them an electric shock and they'll produce offspring through that electric shock. So these religious people say, well, what happened was Mary was outside somewhere walking along and a lightning bolt must have hit her. And that's why she produced an offspring. Now here's a scientific fact for you. Every single offspring produced by electricity is female and never male. I don't think Mary experienced the lightning bolt. I believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. That's my God who does miracles. But again, religious people try to explain it away and argue about it. Matthew twenty two thirty four. But when the Pharisees had heard that he put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Religious people are glad when other religious people are proven wrong, but not when they're caught. Boy, is that ever true. Matthew 22, verse 41. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, whoops, Matthew twenty two forty one. 41. 
while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Religious people miss what the real question is. They think that they have all the answers, and as of yet, they don't even know what the question is. You can't have the right answer unless you first have the right question. Matthew 23, verse 2, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. The religious are drawn to offices, titles, along with authority and control positions. They love the chief seats at public gatherings. That's in Luke chapter 11, verses 43 and 44. And they get angry if you take their position away. Because their identity is wrapped up in their position and not in their service to God. I remember I was uh, working with a pastor in Elliott Lake. And I was his right hand man. I preached when he was gone. I mean, I was, you know, in all intents and purposes, I was the assistant pastor. I was. I know it's hard to believe. And then all of a sudden, our pastor went back down to Tulsa, where he was from. And one of his buddies had graduated from Rainbow Bible Training Center. And he asked his buddy to come and be the assistant pastor at the church. And when he came, I gladly stepped down. This guy was a good teacher, man. Very good teacher. So I gladly stepped down and just went back to ushering and helping and doing whatever I could do. And people came up to me and they were offended. And I told people, don't be offended for me. I said, we're called to be servants, not to operate in positions. Amen. What a good lesson for me to learn, I'll tell you that. Matthew chapter 23, verse 14. Matthew 23, verse 13 and 14. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Hypocrites, two-faced. Pretending, living a religious life, living in your self-righteousness. Verse 14, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. Don't be impressed when people pray long, necessarily. My goodness, there's a cartoon that my kids and I still talk about because it was so funny. Because his dad said, well, son, say grace over the meal. So the son starts to pray, and oh my goodness. Pray, 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 pray. And he's praying, and as surely as the waters travel down the streams, back to the ocean. And, and it's like, my God, talk about religious prayers. Sometimes you've got to stop and listen to ourselves. Dear God, help us. Jesus said, therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Wow. Matthew 23, verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and, and land to make one proselyte, one con conversion. And when that is made, you make him twice more the child of hell than yourselves. Oh, it's heavy stuff. Matthew 23, verse 23, woe unto you, he says. Scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint of anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment and mercy and faith. These ought you have, you should have done. He didn't say don't, don't, uh, don't pay tithes. That's not what he was saying. He said you missed the point. The point is, don't leave the other things that are more important undone. Religious people are sometimes very detailed and outwardly appear to be very holy people, but they keep score in their minds, not love, and constantly compare themselves with other people. Mercy eludes them, and the Bible tells us that mercy is better than justice, than judgment. 
Matthew 23, verse 25, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within you are full of extortion and excess. God's words translation says, How horrible it will be for you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dishes, but inside they're full of greed and uncontrolled desires. Man, Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of that man that defiles him. The difference between religion and faith. Religious people are hypocrites who pay too much attention to outward things. And the inward things they utterly condemn. Matthew 23, verses 26 and 27. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which was within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Religious people are blind to inward weaknesses and needs of their own life and try to fulfill themselves with religious activity to satisfy their insatiable desire or need for acceptance and self-righteousness. Sad place to be. They are typically driven people, religious people. Matthew 23, verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto the whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outside, but are within are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Religious people are addicted to appearance and not to truth, honesty, or realness. I'm almost done. I promise. Matthew 23, verses 29 to 33. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous. And you say that if you had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them of the blood of the prophets. I can tell you right now, that's not true. Religious people are blind to the evil that's in their own hearts and the self-righteous arrogance of comparing themselves to others. There is no humility or, or gentleness in them. No daily repentance for their own thoughts or attitudes of the heart before the Father. Matthew 27, verse 62. My last verse. Now the next day they followed the day of preparation the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate. Religious people are clever and they know how to use, utilize governments. They know how to utilize authorities and, and, and make certain allegiances and utilize certain agencies to work their plan out to their advantage. They're very clever. We must especially take heed of those who corrupt the word of God, no matter what their position is in the church or in civil politics. Believers need to watch out for legalism and hypocrisy, which was the leaven of the Pharisees. Next week we're going to talk about the scribes and the leaven of the Herodians, which, for simplicity's sake, is politics in the church. You've got to be very careful. Keep your mind focused on Christ. You may have a political opinion. It's not necessarily valued here. Just so you know. Because we're focused on keeping our relationship with Christ. So don't be mad at somebody if they don't agree with you politically. That is really not wise. That will divide a church. I've seen it too often. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your goodness, for so great a salvation. Thank you for this wisdom of bewaring of the leaven of the Pharisees. Keep us, Lord God, from religious, and, uh, religious activities and self-righteous appearances. And help us to live a life that honors you and loves you, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. Give someone a hug before you leave. God bless you.